Hi everybody and welcome, this is the Apostate Prophet. I'm here with a very special episode, one that I didn't plan at all, but I'm very pleased about this. I am here together with uh, Fleur Hassan Nahum, who is the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem. And uh, I really want to ask her some very interesting questions. She has been very helpful and amazing, actually. Fleur, how are you doing? I'm very happy that you're here. How are we doing? I don't know. Depends what hour of the day you ask me. I am very happy to be here. Uh, and quick shout out, you are, we are here in uh, the studio of JNS. JNS TV, JNS, JNS TV. underscore TV, who are the people, wonderful people who take, uh, who platform my show, The Quad. Yeah, so The Quad is the show and that is uh, on JNS TV. You can find that on YouTube, check it out. Very crucial work at the moment. Um, Fleur, uh, what does it mean to be the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem? if you want to explain very briefly. Sure. Um, well, I'm one of a few deputy mayors. We're all like ministers in a cabinet, and I'm in charge of foreign relations, economic development, and tourism. Mm -hmm. I've also got another few portfolios like art, but essentially uh, it's a privilege to me to, I've been a city council member for eight years now, mm -hmm. and it's a privilege to wake up every morning and serve the largest city in the country, the capital city of the country, and also the eternal capital of the Jewish people, where we, you know, King David built this city 3,000 years ago to unite all the different Jewish tribes. And so I feel privileged to carry on some of that legacy of, mm -hmm. of trying to be the uniting city, and the city where hopefully the solution to all conflicts will come from. I have been walking through Jerusalem, both the uh, old city and the modern part of it, both of which is uh, incredibly impressive. I speak to a lot of people and I see that, of course, a lot of people have a very fresh memory of October 7, the savagery that was done by Hamas against the people of Israel. How does the, the war and how does October 7 affect Jerusalem right now? So that's a great question because uh, Jerusalem is the city in the country with the largest um, concentration of uh, Muslim Arabs. So 40% of the city uh, Arabs. Um, we call them East Jerusalem Arabs. Some call themselves Palestinians, some don't. Um, everybody can define themselves as they wish. Uh, but essentially, uh, 40% um, when October the 7th happened, we were concerned that the radicals amongst these groups would come up and try to attack. And of course, Hamas on cue called for the first Friday after October 7th for uh, people to come up and storm Temple Mount and cause problems and violence. And thank God, I mean, I'll never forget that day. I was so, so nervous, so worried. And thank God it went by without any incidents. Now, of course, since then we've had four terrorist attacks, but we've had terrorist attacks over the last year in Jerusalem. One terrorist attack that killed 11 people coming out of a synagogue. You know, people have very short memories. And so Jerusalem is always a place where we've experienced, unfortunately, horrific attacks. Um, and, and, you know, but on the whole, we have to be grateful that it's actually been quite calm because if it wasn't, it would be a, a powder keg. And I have to say that I, I give the mayor and this administration a lot of credit for all the bridge building that we've been doing over the last 10 years, especially over the last five years uh, with local leadership. And I'm hoping that some of that goodwill that has been built is, is what's keeping things relatively calm. Mm -hmm. So uh, you brought up one thing, which is that uh, Hamas called upon people to rise up and to attack. Very yeah. much. You see that it just doesn't really happen the way Hamas wants it to happen, which kind of implies that, you know, lots of people here uh, either don't really want to listen to them or are not on board with them. Well, I think that um, the Arab population of Jerusalem has gone through some type of small transformation in the sense that I would say over the last 10 years, there's been a realization and an awakening that the Palestinian leadership is not their salvation. Mm -hmm. Because the leadership, the closest leadership that you have from here, of course, is Ramallah, it's Fatah, it's Mahmoud Abbas. And I think people realize that he's been very busy stealing mm -hmm. uh, from people rather than building any type of yeah. future for his people. 
Um, I think that most Jerusalem Arabs are just grateful to be in the city rather than on the other side of the separation fence. Um, and, you know, because a, an Arab in the city gets every everything else like everybody else, even though most of them are not citizens, they're residents, but they, they have everything, health, education, uh, job opportunities. It's a much better life for them here because they're under our municipality and because our municipality believes in diversity and in embracing all populations. We work very hard on that. Mm -hmm. And I think that apart from, of course, the radicals, which will always be radical, but I think that the majority of the population are just simply happy to be in this side of the wall. Yeah. I also saw some, uh, some surveys, especially uh, since October 7, uh, there has been a great change in uh, public opinion within Israel, uh, where contrary to the aims of Hamas, a lot of uh, Arabs within Israel shifted sharply toward yeah. identifying with Israel and yes. feeling uh, part of Israel. Yes. Do you feel that? I do, actually. And, and you just have to look around and see how most people have reacted to 7th of October. I've got many, many friends. Well, I've always had deep friendships uh, with Arabs in Israel and Jerusalem. But many, uh, many big influences stood up and said, not in my name. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not Zionists, but... This is the savagery is not yeah. what we stand for. And I think that in that sense, Hamas has done a huge disservice to the Palestinian cause. Yeah. I mean, they've done a disservice to the Palestinian cause in so many ways. But I think they thought everybody was going to come on board yeah. and everybody was going to kind of act together to destroy Israel that day, including Hezbollah in the north. And it didn't happen. And they were left alone in this fight. You know, it's, it's kind of mind boggling. When, uh, when October 7 happened, one of my first thoughts was, what are these idiots doing? This is a, literally a suicide mission. Yeah. Uh, I still don't get it. Um, I want to ask you, what do, what, do you think that they actually believed for a second that they could achieve something through this? Were they so deluded? Well, I think <clears throat> that we have to look at the words of somebody like Mossab Hassan, the, you know, the Green Prince. Mm -hmm. um, when they say these people, they're, they're not, uh, these radicals are not living in this life. They're living for the next life. Mm -hmm. And it's you know, years of brainwashing since they're born. They've been taught that the best thing they can do in their lives for their people is to be um, shaheeds, mm -hmm. to, to sacrifice themselves. This is in the school book. I've got the books yeah. where the best thing you can possibly be is like, um, you know, uh, Dalal al-Mughrabi, who, you know, killed herself for the cause by killing 25 people, including eight children. Mm -hmm. And this is in the school book. Uh, and also, I have to add, in the school book that is funded by UNRWA, by the UN, United Nations, yeah. which is in direct contrast and contradiction to their stated aims of peace. Um, and so we have a situation where children have been indoctrinated from the minute they're born in their schools, in the media, by their parents, in the mosques, that really this is what they should be doing. And so when it gets to the day when you're going to get to kill Jews, um, even if you then get arrested or even if you then get killed by soldiers, that is what you've been aiming towards. And, you know, in the footage, that 47-minute horrific footage, one of the main scenes is a guy calling his parents and going, Mom, Dad, I killed 10 Jews. Like, this is a moment to be proud. <laughs> And that just shows you the sickness of the cult that they've been raised in. They don't give their people any type of hope or opportunity of anything. They certainly don't speak about one day there's going to be a peaceful resolution with Israel. It's all about um, brainwashing their kids to believe that if we only hold on and pray and prepare ourselves for this big battle, one day we're going to kick them all out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's why when people talk about the two-state solution, the ridiculousness is not whether Israel is going to accept it or not, Israel's already tried a few times. Yeah. It's whether these people, well, it's even in their lexicon, or whether the two-state solution for them is simply one step towards the complete elimination of Israel and all the Jews. Mm -hmm. And even when they do talk about two states, maybe the more moderate groups in Fatah, they talk about it as one step towards mm -hmm. getting rid of the entire Israel. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think the West tries to see... Um, the Palestinian leadership through their prism, through yeah. their lenses. 
and they don't understand that it's got, you know, one thing, it's like apples and oranges, as yeah. we say. Uh, speaking of taking land and eliminating Israel, you know, one of the most contested things about, uh, about, about, the, about this whole region is Jerusalem, the very city that we are in and talking yeah. about. And um, there is always this, this desire to grab Jerusalem and make it part of this Arab state, yeah. or at least uh, for now, to take East Jerusalem and make it part of that of this state and make it the capital. Uh, obviously, none of that is possible. Well, I would say that 95% of the Arabs in East Jerusalem would not want it to be possible either. <laughs> <laughs> you, th you think that? So you, you think yeah. they would be? They are more satisfied here than they would be under such a. Well, they know what's happening on the other side. The conflict is actually very profitable to a lot of people. People don't talk about the money side of the conflict, mm -hmm. and the money side of the conflict is that the leaders, both of Hamas and Fatah are, have become multi-billionaires yeah. as a result of the conflict because they're not good leaders, benevolent leaders who want to, you know, they want to develop their people and prosperity for all. They're not MBZ. They are leaders who uh, abuse the conflict and make themselves wealthier. Mahmoud Abbas and his, you know, his, his proxies and his friends and his sons are multi-billionaires. A friend of mine was in Ramallah a few weeks ago. He says he's never seen so many Maseratis in one place. We also have footage of, uh, of Gaza before the war. And it's oh, like, uh, it's, it's, people it's think like brilliant. open air prison. It was, yeah. a, it was a country club, but only if you're part of Hamas. Yeah, yeah. So you have to be part of the institution of Hamas to profit from it. And that's why 60% of people were part of Hamas, mm -hmm. because they, it was profitable to be part of Hamas. You get the, you get the, the favors, you get the money, you get the jobs. And that's a really important side of the conflict that people don't understand. It's the ideology, but the ideology is fed by the prosperity of the corruption mm -hmm. of the leaders. Yeah. There was an interview from just a few months ago where uh, the Hamas leadership is asked why they haven't, for example, built uh, shelters for the population. And uh, the spokesperson says, uh, well, we aren't responsible for that. We are, you know, we, we are we make sure to build tunnels for ourselves so we can fight the occupation. Exactly. Uh, what occupation? <laughs> we left in 2005 and they had the opportunity. They could have built the beautiful piece that, of land that was Gaza. They could have built Dubai. They could have built Marbella, which is mm, near where yeah. I come from, the, the Costa del Sol in Spain. And what did they build? They built Afghanistan, Beirut. And that it really is, you know, I, do, I think what you understand, but I think what a lot of people don't understand is that we are facing a big civilizational clash here. Mm -hmm. And just like the world in the 1930s faced Hitler, who wanted the world to look very differently with his fascist Aryan mentality mm. and philosophy, the Islamists, who are mainly sponsored by Iran, mm -hmm. are also dreaming of this world where they will build a caliphate mm -hmm. across the world. We're only the beginning. This is what I keep telling people. We're the first stop yeah. on this tour of turning the whole world uh, and killing all the infidels and turning the whole world into a jihadi caliphate. And what people don't realize is that this is happening here now but it's going to happen everywhere else if we don't stop it. The world stopped Hitler. But if we would have tried to stop Hitler a little bit earlier, maybe so many innocent lives wouldn't have been lost. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, the way that Chamberlain was quite happy to sacrifice Czechoslovakia and just give it like a piece of meat to a lion to Hitler, the world is doing the same thing with Israel when they don't realize that the lion is not going to stop here. Mm -hmm. It's going to keep going and the predator keeps going. And you know who do realize? The moderate uh, Muslim Arab countries. Yeah. Saudi realize it. The UAE realize it. Bahrain realizes it because they've stopped their fundamentalists. Even Egypt realizes it. And who helped Egypt get rid of their version of Hamas, the Salafists? It was Israel in the Sinai. ISIS was there. We helped them get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So we're helping everybody else. And, and, and who is, is, you know, tall enough to help us? Of course, we have our Western allies. But I don't think people understand that the real problem here is that mentality, that mm. philosophy that has found fertile ground in the Palestinian cause 
but it's not even about the Palestinian cause. The Palestinian cause simply plays well on the jihadi Muslim street. And what people don't actually realize is that the Shia Iranians, who are not even Arabs, are using the Arabs yeah. as a sacrificial lamb to their big, wider, sinister plot to rule the world. And that's why Saudi realizes it, because they're now moderate Sunni countries who don't want this Shia homogeny. Hamas made it very clear, right? They made it very clear that, that they want to uh, build a caliphate once they are done with the Jews here. And uh, from here, they want to spread it. So of course, but we see the spread. Realize, people should realize this is like Israel is a, is a, is a forefront here. And uh, even in their view, even in the view of Hamas, if Israel falls, that is the first step to establishing the caliphate and attacking the rest of the world. <laughs> أولا هو تنظيف فلسطين من دنس اليهود واستئصالهم بإذن الله أما الأمر الثاني وهو إقامة الخلافة بعد أن تتعافى الأمة من سرطانها وهو اليهود بإذن الله سبحانه وتعالى I think the Jews are always the, the sign that's uh -huh. coming they, uh -huh. People call it the canary in the mine, right? Uh -huh. So in the 1930s when they started with all these anti-Jewish laws in Germany I mean, you think didn't people realize? But they didn't. Yeah. Because the Jew is always the convenient scapegoat. Yeah. Always. Throughout history. And we're just simply seeing it again. We didn't think we'd see it. But there's a difference now. The difference today is that we have a country. We have an army. We have allies. And Jewish blood today has a price. And that's what we're seeing. They can't do anything they want anymore, and that is just... They did bad enough things on, on October 7th, unfortunately, and if we would have let them, they would have continued throughout the whole country. It, th their intention was a genocide. Yes, it was. They were just stopped. So yeah, they yeah. did as much as they could possibly do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what they did. They did as much as they could possibly do until they were stopped. Mm -hmm. If they hadn't been stopped, if people wanted Israel the way that they do now, people want Israel to roll over and lose this war. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you feel in Jerusalem, in this historic, beautiful city, which which is amazing, by the way, I mean, this this is real leadership. Uh, do you feel a tension between the religious groups? Is it there? Do you mean between Muslims and and Jews? Yeah. Or, you know, when you say religious groups, there's a tension between secular Jews and ultra-Orthodox Jews in the city, enough, which enough. is what I'm dealing with most <laughs> of the time. Um, look, I will say that there's always some type of religious uh, tension here, but for the most part, really, um, we live and work together, share the same malls, and you've walked down the street here. Do you feel tensions? I don't. I walk around, I go to different Arab neighborhoods and people are like, aren't you scared? No. You know what's so funny to me? Uh, I live in Turkey and Turkey has a, has a Kurdish population yeah. that has been, uh, that Turkey has been having a Subjugating, huge conflict yeah. with. Yeah. And you can never imagine in Turkey, uh, uh, you know, Kurdish on you know, boards, on state buildings and things like that every, anywhere. Um, I came here to Israel, to Jerusalem, but also to the rest of Israel and I see Hebrew, Arabic, English. And English. Hebrew, Everywhere. Arabic, English. Every Hebrew, street Arabic, sign, English. every bus stop. Those are the three languages um, that are shown in this country, the public languages of this country. And I, I think that there's no replacement mm -hmm. for coming and seeing for yourself. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I received a group once of South Africans, mm -hmm. uh, also black, also white, um, members of parliament from South Africa. They spent a week looking for apartheid. They couldn't find it. They couldn't recognize it <laughs> to what they thought apartheid was. They saw people walking around in the street, in the buses, in the trains, in the parks, in the cafes, in the malls. And they're like, well, what's going on here? I thought there, I thought there was apartheid. Um, and then, quite funnily, they went to see, a, they went to Ramallah to visit supposedly a refugee camp. Uh -huh. and there's no such thing as refugee camps. It's basically just, you know, crowded neighborhoods. Uh -huh. You know, most, I think most modern cities, you could say that every neighborhood is a refugee camp. It's just crowded neighborhoods with buildings. Uh -huh. So they went to see this refugee camp. And, the, and the, they said to them, oh, the head of the refugee camp is coming now to explain to us what's going on here. And he shows up in a Porsche. 
<laughs> and, then, and then they go to visit politicians in Ramallah uh -huh. and they shake the hands of the white South Africans, but they won't shake the hands of the black South Africans. And so they realized that, in fact, Israel is an inclusive, diverse country that accepts and loves everyone. And in fact, it was the Palestinians, especially the leadership, who were the real racists. And I think that only when you come to Israel do you realize that everything you thought you knew is turned on its head. It's I, was, I was always told that Israel is just hunting and killing Arabs and Muslims. Oh, please. <laughs> uh, it's, it's ridiculous. And that's why you have to really come here and yeah, see for yourself. Yeah, yeah. And that's why, you know, when I hear people accusing Israel of what it does, I have to laugh because they have zero concept mm -hmm. of what really goes on here. You look at the police force in Jerusalem. Do you know how many Arabs in the police force in Jerusalem? I see it. I see it. The Arabs in the police force. Yeah. Um, you know, when you think of the police, you think of this, uh, what, what they've told you is this war, Jewish oppressor. It's a, uh, there's so many Arabs in the police force because they love being in the police force. It's, it's very interesting. It, it, it is interesting. And I think that Israel is unfairly maligned and mm -hmm. it's maligned for political um, and fundamentalist reasons. Mm -hmm. And when people actually show up here, I'm not saying we don't have political problems. Of course we do. But it's got nothing to do uh, with you know, it's got nothing to do with any of Israel's policies. If Hamas or if the jihadis put down their weapons tomorrow, there would be peace. If we put down our weapons, there would be a Jewish genocide. Exactly. Dear um, Fleur Hassan Nahum. Thank you. Why is a, an obviously white Western person like you in charge of... <laughs> <laughs> I love it when they call me British colonial settler. Hassan, that's a really... That's a real colonizer's name, <laughs> Hassan. <laughs> very, very briefly, uh, people have this stupid perception that uh, Israelis are just a bunch of European white people who came here and took over. Yeah. Obviously, this is not true in your case and well, in my mother's, case of others. Well, my mother's but, Moroccan, and when uh, my sister and I did our DNA, I'm actually partly Middle Eastern as well, Mor uh, Spanish Moroccan. Uh -huh. I've got a little bit of, uh, I've got a little bit of different things. But uh, listen, Jews are from Judea. Mm -hmm. This is where, you know, the, the very definition of an indigenous nation mm -hmm. is where a people were created. The Jewish people were created here. This is the land of our forefathers. You can go and visit the graves. It's also the land of, you know, the forefathers of Islam, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, um, and our foremothers. And so this is where we're from. This is where we're created. We have always been ready to share this land. 20% of our citizens are Arab citizens, Muslim citizens. We have a small percentage of Arab Christians. Mm -hmm. um, the question and the root of the conflict is not that there isn't a Palestinian state. Mm -hmm. The root of the conflict is that there's a Jewish state and that the Palestinian leadership have never accepted that we're here. The minute they accept we're here, the next day we have peace. That's simple as that. Thank you so much. This was a great pleasure. Thank you. Thanks everyone for watching, for listening, and I will see you next time.